Welcome to the next in a series called People and Places. Today's topic, Fort Ord. The Fort Ord Reuse Authority, FORA, responsible for the oversight of Monterey Bay Area economic recovery from the closure of and the reuse planning of the former Fort Ord military base. The former Fort Ord, located on the California coastline near the Monterey Peninsula, consists of 45 square miles, approximately 28,000 acres. As of June 30th, 2020, FORA concluded its 26-year effort to oversee the Monterey Bay Regional Economic Recovery from the closure of the Army installation. The FORA website will remain active and managed by the County of Monterey. But let's go back to 2016 to see how we got here today. It's nearly impossible to discuss the history of Monterey without including the military. The military has been intertwined historically, economically, and culturally from the beginning, from the Buffalo Soldiers to the Cavalry, to the Naval Postgraduate School to the Coast Guard. Each of these institutions carry a rich history. However, today we're talking about the Defense Language Institute in Fort Ord. These two institutions cannot be more different, and yet they each serve and continue to serve vastly important roles in the community. The legacies of both the Defense Language Institute and Fort Ord will reverberate for generations to come. The military has been an integral part of Monterey's identity since its inception. The Spaniards came to California in 1770 and founded the Carmel Mission, as well as the Presidio of Monterey to protect it, using Native American laborers to build their outposts. In the years that followed, Monterey became the capital of the province of California. The Mexicans took over from the Spanish and eventually U.S. Commodore John D. Sloat took Monterey from the Mexicans in a peaceful coup during the Mexican-American War. John Drake Sloat arrives with the Pacific Squadron uh, in 1846. The, the uh, Pacific Flotilla has uh, standing orders in the case that there's a, a war with Mexico, that they should seize the ports of, of Mexico on the Pacific coast. And the most important port in California was uh, Monterey at Monterey. So that's what happened. They, the, the, the sailors and the Marines landed and they raised the American flag at the Custom House Plaza. It was a peaceful occasion because the garrison was not willing to fight. Uh, the Californios were not on the best of terms with the Mexican government to begin with, so it was really uh, kind of a change of, of ownership for them. And uh, they were, as, as the Americans had special orders not to mistreat any of the, anyone in the population. There were already a number of Americans living here. So it was a peaceful affair, and that's when, and so that, the, the flag was raised on the 7th of July, 1846. And immediately the, uh, the Marines and the sailors went to the top of the nearest hill, and they built a gun installation to protect the, uh, the, the port and the harbor from the potential of a, a Mexican counterattack. Through all eras of ownership, Monterey went through varying stages of occupation and desertion. The Presidio has been moved abandoned and founded again, depending on the favor of Monterey's ever-changing occupants. The only building that still stands from the original Presidio of Monterey is the Royal Presidio Chapel, which has remained in use since its founding by Father Junipero Serra in 1794. The U.S. Army took permanent interest in the Presidio during the Spanish-American War in 1898, and the Presidio has remained functional and occupied ever since. When the Army first came here in 1902, uh, to build the Presidio of Monterey. Uh, they didn't actually first call it the Presidio of Monterey. Its, its first official name was Ord Barracks. It was called Ord Barracks in 1903 in, uh, in order to honor an officer who had served in Monterey during the Mexican-American War, who was briefly in charge of construction at what would eventually become the Presidio of Monterey. And his name was General Edward O.C. Ord. He actually helped oversee the construction of the gunworks. Uh, he would later go on to become, during the Civil War, a very important general and was involved with uh, helping force General Lee to surrender at Appomattox. So when the Army decided to uh, name the installation formally, of course, they like to look for uh, officers who have a connection to the local area. And General Ord fit that bill very well. He was famous and he had actually served in the area. So that's what it was called Ord Barracks. But during the, the next year, some of the local citizens approached the War Department with another idea. They thought it would be uh, a better idea to name the new installation the Presidio of Monterey, after the original Royal Presidio of Monterey that was established by the Spanish in 1770. And the War Department said, yeah, okay, we can do that. One reason why they would have said okay was because um, there was in fact a Presidio of San Francisco already established by the Army and operating as a military base. 
So it wasn't a big, it wasn't a terribly big ask. So in 1904, the name was changed from Ord Barracks to the Presidio Monterey. Unfortunately, this demoted General Ord. So, um, and folks remembered that. So, and it comes along the, the, second, the, the First World War, and uh, uh, the Army was provided with a bunch of new funding, and they took the opportunity to survey the West Coast, and they realized they would need more training areas, especially for the Presidios of Monterey and San Francisco. They didn't have a large training area at that time where they could maneuver, and importantly, do live fire exercises, especially with artillery and things of that nature. So the Army took the opportunity to buy some land in 1917, uh, and they didn't change the name, they didn't establish the name. First it was just called the, the Monterey Military Reservation, and it was just a, a, an undeveloped chunk of land. Uh, but in the 1930s, the Army began establishing small camps, um, bivouacs, and soldiers from the Presidio of San Francisco and the Presidio of Monterey would go there in the summer times and they would, they would train. Eventually, one of those camps was called Camp Ord. So in the 1930s, there was a Camp Ord. Uh, later on in time, a decade later, uh, we begin to mobilize for World War II, and the Army decides that it's going to build a major installation on the Central Coast. And of course, they, they decided that now we can take General Ord, who originally was uh, the namesake for the Presidio Monterey at Ord Barracks, and has a Camp Ord, an informal name that was established on the military reservation, and we'll give, it, we'll give the entire area the official name, uh, the formal official name, Fort Ord. And that happened in 1940. Beginning in 1904, the cavalry at the Presidio rode north to what was then known as the Giggling Reservation in search of more space to train. What was meant to be a temporary training camp eventually grew into the military giant known as Fort Ord. Completely overshadowing its parent base, the Army bought the land in 1917 and continued to purchase surrounding land over the following years. In 1940, all land was consolidated and officially designated as Fort Ord. In the meantime, the Presidio continued to house various branches of Army operations. After World War II, a small school known as the Military Intelligence Service Language School was relocated to Monterey from Fort Snelling in Minnesota. MISLS started as a Japanese language school and had originated in Tokyo to teach U.S. diplomats Japanese. It was a, it's a large language school. The military needs uh, linguists who are trained in various foreign languages that have national security uh, importance. And during World War II, the most important was Japanese. So that school was founded to train Japanese linguists, and some 6,000 linguists were trained uh, by the predecessor organization of the Defense Language Institute before the end of that conflict. And then the, um, many of them also served in the occupation, so they helped interpret, interrogate, and, and uh, translate documents, all those kind of functions. This program shifted focus and locations from during the war from Tokyo to San Francisco to Minnesota and back to California at war's end, where it was renamed the Army Language School. The Army was happy with the success of MISLS during the war and decided to expand its mission. China, Russia, and Korea were new security threats and new language courses were added to Japanese. Eventually, the Army settled on the name Defense Language Institute, or DLI. The need for defense language training proved to be vital, and the school enjoyed modest growth in the years to come. This growth, however, was minuscule in comparison to the exploding population of Fort Ord. Fort Ord became the largest army base on the West Coast, where 1.5 million soldiers got their basic training over eight decades. Fort Ord reached its peak during the Vietnam War, with 50,000 soldiers reporting for duty. However, in the wake of the Vietnam War and national introspection that followed, something entirely unexpected happened. Peace, or at least the absence of outright warfare. Boots on the ground were replaced by intelligence operations, and the Cold War informed our new military strategy. Our alliance on infantry collapsed. Since basic training was its main purpose, significant elements of Fort Ord's core mission became intelligence training. Intelligence training was its core mission, and the number of languages, their various dialects, steadily increased. Fort Ord tried desperately to adapt by consolidating their training facilities and creating the Light Infantry Division, a highly trained rapid deployment brigade designed to go anywhere, anytime. The Light Infantry proved highly instrumental in the Gulf War, but these adaptations proved to be too little, too late. Fort Ord was simply too big, unwieldy, and too expensive. 
In 1991, the Base Closure and Realignment Commission, or BRAC, voted to close Fort Ord, and the base closed its doors in 1994. At the time, it was the largest U.S. military base ever to be closed. The Presidio was not safe from this drastic round of closures either. The Department of Defense voted to close the Presidio and move the DLI to Arizona. The Monterey City Manager, Fred Muir, did not take this decision at face value. As a local veteran and former Public Works Director at Fort Ord, Muir just happened to be the most qualified man in the county to take on the Army establishment. He waged an extensive and exhaustive campaign to convince the committee to overturn their decision. He immersed himself in the process and demonstrated how unique the school was and how Monterey had become such an integral part of its operations. This action paved the way for what came to be known as the Monterey Model. More on that later. While Fort Ord has been slowly transitioning out of its military culture and identity, the DLI has been quietly and steadily entrenching itself within Monterey's community, offering a surprising cross-cultural gift. And what is so special about the DLI? It is a unique institution fostering a genuine understanding of languages and cultures across the globe. The Defense Language Institute recruits teachers from their native countries to come to Monterey to teach service members the subtle intricacies of their colloquial language. This is not your typical basic training base. Our mission is to teach uh, to the Department of Defense, uh, the Uniformed Military of the Department of Defense, uh, language and cultures as part of their uh, requirements for their mission as they go out and, and are assigned to the field. And so we do that at all different levels, uh, from very, very basic language familiarization all the way to the most advanced levels of near-native uh, proficiency and fluency. This is an elite school unto which the best and brightest military personnel are accepted. The same standards are extended to the teachers. DLI's 8,500-person workforce is living, shopping, and mingling with the locals. They bring their families and culture and fall in love with our own. I know that the city of Monterey prides itself uh, on its diversity and, and the city of Monterey and the Defense Language Institute contribute to that greatly. A lot of our instructors live in the local communities and bring their cultures and their languages to this region. The Monterey model was the brainchild of then Congressman Sam Farr and former city manager Fred Muir a cooperative cost-saving partnership between the city of Monterey and the Presidio. The program continued to be such a success that other military communities across the country have adopted the Monterey model. Thank God for uh, Fred Muir, who had been a, a, you know, a colonel in the army and had been running Fort Ord and new infrastructure and became the city manager of Monterey. And he says, hey, as a city manager, Everything you do on your DLI base, we do right outside the gate. You got public works, we got public works. You have electricians, we have electricians. We have everything you need. Why don't we just take over all those operations? And it took some special legislation that I was able to carry to create what we had as an exception to the rule and saying, let Monterey be a model to see if this works out. It saved the Army somewhere in the range of, I think, $4 million the first year. And the Army said, this is pretty cool. Since then, we've now gotten the entire United States to follow. It's up to each of the services, the Army, the Navy, Marine Corps, and so on, um, Air Force, to decide in their bases whether they want to contract with a local community. But we've also challenged the local community to say, think about it. If the DLI is such a boon for our local economy and cultural identity, what are we doing to ensure it stays here? It's important to note the difference between the DLI and the Presidio. One of the biggest misconceptions about the DLI is that it and the Presidio are one and the same. The Presidio is an army base that houses many military departments. The DLI is its best known tenant which makes the Presidio kind of a landlord. The Monterey model created the partnership between the City of Monterey and Presidio, whereby the city provides paid maintenance support for the landlord's facility. So the Air Force is actually trying to replicate the Monterey model at 51 Air Force bases across the United States. Wow. Um, it's a change of culture because most military, well, most humans don't like to be dependent on anyone else. They like to stand alone. They like to be independent. So it is a change of culture to think about, uh, oh, gee, I may have to ask the city of such and such for help on this. They do that in combat routinely. The Army routinely asks the Air Force for air support 
or the artillery for artillery support. So it's, it's a cultural change, but as I look to the military bases of the future, in many places, the best way to do it would be to do it like we're doing here in Monterey. Uh, that relationship is one where the city provides uh, a range of municipal services to the installation that normally an army base has to provide for itself. So it has to have the personnel, the equipment, all of the infrastructure to, um, to provide for itself building maintenance, custodial services, grounds maintenance, engineering support, traffic engineering, a whole range of, of functions that uh, because of the work of Fred Muir, Leon Panetta, Sam Farr, and others uh, that came before, long before me, uh, we are able to enjoy this unique relationship. So anything from, from road repairs to, to building construction are all, uh, all in that contract. And what that does is it actually saves uh, the U.S. government uh, and the Presidio of Monterey a great deal of money every single year uh, because uh, the economy is a scale. Uh, we don't have to go and, and you know, buy new trucks. We don't have to buy or, or hire new employees to do things. All that is provided to us by the city of Monterey. Deputy City Manager Dino Pick, who also happens to be an alumnus of DLI, as well as the school's former commandant, now carries the torch. Not only does the Monterey model help the military cut costs, it supports job growth for the city of Monterey. Not only keeps the city uh, staff working very diligently and very hard and provides resources to the city in the form of that uh, that contractual um, obligation with the Presidio that allows the city to retain a very highly skilled workforce of craftsmen from various trades that are able to work on city buildings throughout the city and also provide that service to the Presidio Monterey. It also allows us, by keeping DLI there, to enjoy the roughly $1.5 billion annual economic impact that DLI MPS and the associated military missions on the peninsula provide to our community. So there's an enormous economic impact that our hospitality sector, our businesses, our restaurateurs enjoy because of the military presence here and the, the significant economic impact. It created a unique space to integrate the military with the civilian community in a way that didn't exist anywhere else in the United States before its inception. The DLI is a prime example for an educational institution that both generates jobs and enriches Monterey's culture. Worst case scenario, what would happen if the Presidio faces closure in the next BRAC round and the Presidio is forced to relocate? The bad news is, no one knows. The good news is that the powers that be are working hard to ensure that that doesn't become a problem. So in addition to our Monterey model, so that ongoing effort to ensure that the base is, is functioning in a cost-efficient, cost-effective manner, uh, the City Council has endorsed an $80,000 contract with a firm in Washington, D.C. that we are working closely with to conduct a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats analysis or SWOT analysis uh, to collect data, look at how things were done in the last BRAC round, 2005, when both MPS and DLI were under consideration, and then look at how the world has changed to present day and provide us with a good new and updated baseline with data about the, the strengths and weaknesses of our installations, and arguments that may be, ba may be made by the federal government, potentially other states, to move the missions out of Monterey and, and then arm us with the arguments uh, to, to thwart uh, those, those critiques. In 2014, Monterey was designated the language capital of the world, a title that helps make the case that we are better served by keeping all these institutions here. It took a couple years for one of the base commanders to say, well, let's give this a try. And it was first, as I recall, an elevator contract and then a fire alarm contract. And uh, the colonel said, well, you guys are doing a good job and we're saving money. And it was soon, can you take care of our roads? Can you take care of the roofs of our buildings? Can you take care of our plumbing? And we kept saying yes, yes, and yes. And pretty soon we were doing, my guess it was, three, four million dollars worth of work. And uh, the colonel said, 
you're saving us millions of dollars. And I said, what I want, I'm going to ask you to do something no contractor has ever asked you to do. I want you to have the Army Audit Agency audit the city of Monterey because we need to see what an outsider says, an outside audit agency says about the cost of our service and the quality of our service. So he did that. And in 2000, the Army Audit Agency said that we were doing the work 41% cheaper than they had been getting the work done before. And we were doing it quicker and better. So that was pretty good. So we continued to grow. And it wasn't as though the Army was subsidizing uh, the military, because we weren't. But we also weren't making a profit. Our profit was keeping them open. But we were getting our costs reimbursed. So that was really good for the city because most bureaucracies, most governments work with the budget mentality. What are the things that the military is doing there that you do alongside them that you could do more cost effectively? And if you think about it, that partnership ought to be entered into. So the legislation allows each of the services to, and the, I think the one that's been most successful with it, I've heard, is the Air Force, because they went to the city managers of the bases that their, their uh, cities their bases are in and says, give us your ideas. We're not going to tell you what we want to do. What do you think you can do for us? And they said the ideas they got were so far greater than anything they would have thought of within the, uh, the Defense Department. So I think the Monterey model is really going to be a key to just better use of limited taxpayer money in running military bases and the communities that they most affect. It is because we have a great partnership with the, uh, with the city of Monterey. And, and really it's much more than a contract. It is truly, truly a partnership. Uh, when we have an issue, uh, we can reach out to the city and, and they'll help us out with it. I had the opportunity of being in the, in the military now for almost 26 years and been stationed in a lot of different places, uh, both in the United States and, and overseas. And I'll tell you, the relationship the military has here on the peninsula uh, is absolutely unique. Uh, the, uh, the, the community is very welcoming of the military here, uh, and the military here is, uh, is very engaged, very engaging. Uh, the quality of uh, the soldier, sailor, airman, and marine uh, in Monterey is, uh, is very high quality. Uh, they're, they're all very exceptional in what they do, which is not unique to our military nowadays, uh, but uh, the relationship that they enjoy uh, with the community is, uh, is something to behold. The continued and expanding use of the Monterey model is one element that strengthens the bond between city and base. Legislation is currently in the works to further expand and strengthen this arrangement. Fort Ord was not so fortunate. It was all but abandoned to Monterey County, who not only lost a solid economic base, but also inherited nearly 29,000 acres of hazardous military hand-me-down land in various states of neglect. Then Congressman Sam Farr negotiated the transfer from the military at no cost to the county. But what we inherited was a decaying mass of outdated infrastructure. You know, I think we've really learned that when we are given free land, um, that we really need to look carefully um, at what some of the, of the costs might really be. So we, we found on Fort Ord that um, the land was free but the costs of taking down buildings, uh, rebuilding infrastructure uh, was uh, very, very expensive, especially because those buildings have asbestos and lead paint. So um, it's, I think we would want to look very carefully uh, at any, uh, any new gift of land uh, to make sure that uh, there aren't some hidden costs there. With the closure of Fort Ord, we had 28,000 acres that nobody knew anything about because essentially it had a fence around it while the military was there and they never allowed anybody in. So all of a sudden it was a big discovery factor. What's out here? There's all kinds of buildings. There were places where ammunition was used and war games were fought. And, um, some of the buildings were brand new. Some of the buildings were old and couldn't be occupied. So it was just sort of one, a big discovery factor, and then a big land rush. Oh my God, this is in, in our territory in Marina. No, this is in Seaside. No, this is in the county of Monterey. So it was a lot of political jurisdictions. But the big issue, and then was, well, what are we going to do with it? And, you know, putting out sort of requests for proposals. What are ideas out there? 
Everyone thought they had the perfect solution of what to do with it. Many ideas were tossed around and it became apparent that we would need a caretaker to act as a referee for the neighboring municipalities. Thus was born the Fort Ord Reuse Authority. The Fort Ord Reuse Authority, or F-O-R-A, is not part of the Army. It is actually a state agency that is responsible to do the coordination requirements for uh, among all the different uh, reusers or the different jurisdictions, the city, the county, um, Cal State Monterey Bay, they, uh, they're sort of a, a giant manager coordinator for, um, for much of those other use, reuse of the property. How do they plan to go about improving these three E's? And where are we now? The three E's to me is all about economic recovery, environmental conservation, and education. Those three are, are crucial and central to what we do at Fort Ord. Former White House Chief of Staff Leon Panetta championed CSUMB as an appropriate reuse as swords into plowshares. This route certainly made the most sense. In basic training in the military, the Army receives young adults on their first outing away from home and teaches them discipline and life skills. At the heart of it, it's not all that different from a university. As obvious as the decision seems today, it wasn't so obvious at the time. A federal prison was seriously considered in lieu of an educational institution. As crazy as it sounds now, it was a real possibility. And while it was painful to go through, in the long run, it was going to be okay if we have appropriate leadership and political courage to get done what needs to be done. So we've been somewhat successful so far, in particular California State University Monterey Bay has been able to create a rather thriving, active campus that is sort of at the central core of all of the educational reuse on Fort Ord, even though we have well over a dozen different educational entities that are getting pieces of the former Fort Ord, including University of California and Monterey Peninsula College and York School and Chartwell School and Monterey College of Law and Monterey Institute of Research Astronomy and many others. Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, in fact, has reopened a number of the schools on the former Fort Ord that were closed in the past. So this is a very active educational reuse program. And with that education at the center, the economic recovery that, that complements and benefits from that, that core is also ongoing. So there are commercial uses, there will be other job creation activities, tourism activities. We have the dedication of the National Monument that is also a recreation and access that very much complements what California State University Monterey Bay is doing. So it's, it's an active educational economic recovery program that both provides educational services and creates jobs for the local folks. We were hoping to take a place that had been used to train the youth of America to be soldiers, uh, to be scholars and engineers and teachers and so on in the future, so that it was, it was a good transition these schools create quality jobs and are good for everyone. Officials hope to promote more growth of this nature going forward. After extensive cleanup, Fort Ordoon State Park dedication in 2009 was a refreshing step towards environmental conservation. Four miles of Monterey County coastline were converted from a rifle range to panoramic trails for hiking, biking, and are now open for public use. In 2012, President Obama elevated 14,000 acres to National Monument status. Unfortunately, the dedication of Fort Ord National Monument came with a huge compromise. Half of those 14,000 acres are still not at our disposal. The Army is still cleaning up its massive mess accumulated over decades of munitions training. It's taken them over 20 years to clean up roughly 19% of 8,000 acres. When Fort Ord was in its heyday as a training facility, it was about 28,000 acres. So that is the area that's this entire map. Most of the area was, uh, was not used for training with ordnance and explosives. Mainly the area that we see here highlighted in a slightly different color was the concentrated area where the Army uh, designated it to use, uh, use as a training facility for ordnance and explosives. And about uh, 7,000, over 7,000 acres were identified to, uh, 
that had a requirement to be evaluated for ordnance and explosives cleanup. And the Army is still in the process of cleaning up uh, ordnance here on the former Fort Ord, a process that is anticipated to last at, at least another eight to ten years. We would like to uh, say that we're about halfway done with the ordnance and explosives cleanup, which started in 1993, and we've cleaned more than um, close to 4,000 acres, more than 3,500 acres so far. The munitions cleanup for the National Monument is being directly supervised and handled by the United States Army. There's other munitions cleanup on properties that will be used for new buildings, new jobs, Monterey Peninsula Colleges, a public safety officer program, the Veterans Cemetery, some pieces to CSU. Those are being done by the Fort Ord Reuse Authority under a contract with the United States Army. So technically, the Army is doing all of this cleanup. The uh, Army is responsible for doing all the munitions removal. But about 3,300 acres of it is being done under a contract with the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, and we're actively engaged in that daily. But we do, uh, while these are some, or, uh, some examples of ordinance that you find on former Fort Ord, we do ask that um, if you happen to be uh, on Fort Ord, or because we live in a military-oriented community, occasionally, people brought these home and put them in their garage. If you see things like these, um, whether it's on the former Fort Ord or in the community, we ask you to do three things. One, the three R's. Recognize that this is a piece of ordinance and has some uh, potential safety hazards if you touch it. Um, and then the next is retreat, uh, the, the second R. Uh, retreat, walk away, please don't touch it, don't bang it with a hammer, uh, don't touch it, just leave it there. And then finally, report it. Uh, let someone know. And in many instances, it's just calling 911 and there's a whole series of things that would happen. But again, because we live in a military community and there was, um, you know, people occasionally brought things home that they shouldn't have, um, you know, we just would like to maintain an overall awareness for ordnance and explosives that could be out there. Uh, they're very rare to find them outside the borders of Fort Ord. Um, but just in case, again, the three R's, recognize, report, and retreat. So in this large area, it can't be done at the same time. We do have some endangered species, uh, some plant communities that are on top of the ground, and either on top of the ground and underneath the ground, we do have ordnance and explosives that we have to look for. The way that we take care of looking for ordnance here is the first thing we have to do is remove the vegetation and that could be done in really two different ways. One, we could cut it, cut the vegetation, um, and secondarily, we also use prescribed burns to remove the vegetation because of the type of plants that are on top of this large uh, area that's here on the map in green, we do conduct prescribed burns. When the, the burns actually help the plants because they've adapted to, a, uh, to be a fire-dependent community. So once we've removed the vegetation, again, whether it's prescribed burns or cutting, then we actually send people into the area with in various instruments to look for the ordinance that's either immediately seen on the ground on the top, and other instruments uh, can go below ground to look for ordinance, and they give us a signal digitally on a map, or they can also give us an audible signal. They can ring off. That does leave us with the other 7,000 plus acres that are already open. Many trails are already in use for horseback riding, biking, and hiking. In addition, the City of Marina has set aside 36 acres between the National Monument and the State Park as a way of connecting the two. This land includes an abandoned roller rink and a swimming pool, both of which will be renovated and reintegrated into the public space. People will be able to hike, ride horses, bikes, and just enjoy the land. This is a positive step forward for the environment, education, and the economy alike. And the federal government paid and, and for accepted the responsibility to do all the cleanups. This was, instead of the federal government saying, well, we'll do the cleanup, we'll do a little bit each year, for us to know, why don't you just give us all the money up front? It's about $100 million. And that took years. I really worked hard to make sure that we could transfer that and said, okay, Flora, you can have the $100 million, but that's all you get. And you got to do the job with that money. So they went out to a private contractor and they're essentially ahead of schedule and below budget so far and cleaning up what they have to clean up. But until it's all cleaned up in the backlands, that can't be used by the public, can't even be accessed for off-road vehicles or, or bicycles or, or even for hiking. 
So there's still a, land, a lot of the land in the middle of Fort Ord, in the, in the center where all the uh, ordinances were shot, uh, the shells were shot. Some of them didn't go off, and that's what they're worried about. So they have to clean all that stuff up, and that just, there's no fast way to clean it up. There's a bit getting better ways to detect whether what's buried below the surface is a Coke can or a grenade, but the cleaning up is still digging that hole and, and pulling it out very carefully. It was assumed that the base reuse recovery program was a 20 to 25 year program. That was the assumption in the 1990s. So in 1997, when those projections were put into a base reuse plan, that would be 2022 or something like that. I don't think that the redevelopment will be finished until closer to 2030. So we're behind in part because of the, uh, there are three major factors. One was the United States Army in doing its cleanup and remediation program was delayed by a court case that made, that required the United States Army to start over on a lot of its remediation programs, in particular with munitions and explosives. And so that's now underway and it should be complete over the next six, seven, eight years. The second reason was we had a major downturn in the last decade. We had from 2006 to 2012 almost no redevelopment projects moving ahead at Fort Ord. Looking at the numbers, it's very disheartening that after 20 plus years, this is as far as we've gotten. Politics, infighting, and the lack of decisive action have been the root cause of this slow process. Added with the shock of the economy collapse in 2008, all progress came to a grinding halt. We have a lot going on today. You know, there's five or six or seven major projects you can see under construction just anywhere you go right now on the major thoroughfares, there's activity. But for six years, with the exception of the road work that Fora was doing, very little construction happened here on former Fort Ord. So that delayed the process. That recession really pushed the absorption rates or the marketing or for the property multiple years out. So the, our ec economic consultants have told us we might be looking into 2030 or later before that's completed, primarily because of that. The third reason is the actual time that it takes to do munitions and explosives removal is a lot longer than anybody thought in the 1990s. The United States Army initially thought they would be able to complete everything by 2000 and transfer all the properties by 2000. They're now ex expecting with all the work that's required and the burn regimen and all the activities that it won't be until into the 2022 or 2023 before all of that work's done. Well, the military law allows, I mean, the federal law says that the military has to clean up all the dirt. They don't have to clean up above the dirt. So anything they contaminated, the water system that was out there had to be uh, cleaned up, still is, is a work in progress. Uh, the, uh, the, the dunes that were given to the state parks, all the lead that from the firing ranges had to be uh, raked up uh, down to about 15 inches, uh, a multi-million dollar project, took years to, to do. Uh, all the uh, garb old garbage pit, which the waste in there that were uh, toxic had to be cleaned up. The motor pool that had uh, allowed oil and grease and other things to get into the ground, ground had to be cleaned up. So depending on, uh, but the buildings uh, that were contaminated with asbestos or lead paint or things like that that were no longer allowed to be used, uh, the local community had to find ways to clean that up. And now the university, which inherited all what they call the hammerheads, which were these big barracks where hundreds of people were housed, but built not to code, full of asbestos, a real liability, they've never been able to use, and they're sitting there. It's going to take millions of dollars to tear them down. You have to tear them down. There's no reuse. And uh, that's a still work in progress. And I think the university has located a, a source. It's not federal money that will pay for taking those buildings down so they can reuse that land for university property. These deserted buildings, also known as blight, are another huge source of controversy for the local populace. They are an eyesore in an otherwise pristine environment. They are expensive to clean up and the process to tear them down is a long one. These buildings were built in the 1940s for World War II and were only intended to exist temporarily. And yet, here they are. These are not harmless. These are ridden with asbestos, lead, and other contaminants. The cleanup process for these buildings is costly. 
when uh, the Fort Ord Reuse Authority was created in 1994, the United States military was in the process of conveying the 5,700 buildings on Fort Ord that they no longer needed. Those 5,700 buildings had been constructed starting in the 1930s through 1999-2000, some of them prior to when there were restrictions about using things like lead-based paint and asbestos and fluorescent fixtures that might have had PCBs. So some, many of these buildings have real issues about reusing them in modern day. Not just about the contaminants in the building, the buildings were um, part of a military operation that wasn't necessarily built to municipal standards or civilian standards, I'll call it. A bold and cooperative initiative must take place in order to rid Fort Ord of the blight. In uh, 1951 or 52, they decided, the Army decided to make Fort Ord a, a permanent Army base. It had been built up with temporary buildings during World War II, so you, so you had a rapid, it was the largest building project ever in Monterey County, when 1940, 1941, uh, 1,100 temporary structures, wooden buildings, were put up to house this huge presence, this military presence that overnight blossomed. Uh, and, but those, those, those buildings were basically used throughout the entire history of the post until the post was closed after the end of the Cold War uh, in 1994. So those military standards often were poured in place concrete that didn't comply with the seismic safety issues today, the, just a number of issues. So when the Army disposed of these buildings and conveyed them to others, it was the responsibility of the entity that gets the buildings to either decide to reuse them and bring them up to code or demolish them and start over. And what we discovered in the late 1990s and into the first part of this century was that it's more expensive to try to rehabilitate these buildings and keep them because there's so many contaminants and so little compliance with modern building code that it costs more to go in and retrofit the building than if you demolish them and build them in a much more economic way and energy efficient way that you couldn't do with the buildings the way they're currently structured. So we have already demolished about half of the buildings here. I mean, it's a substantial cost. One building, a two-story barracks building, can cost as much as 75000 or more to demolish. And one of the three-story or four-story poured-in-place concrete buildings can cost a million dollars to demolish because not, this is not just about tearing it down and taking away. It's because there's lead, asbestos, and other potential contaminants in the construction materials from when they were built. Right now, the Fort Ord Reuse Authority is issuing a request for proposals, and we've just received proposals in from industrial hygienists who will go in and do the surveys and detect what's in the building so that we understand what the full scope of that work has to be. And it, it goes beyond that. These buildings have been empty for a while, so we have to make sure that we go in and check to see if there are bats in the buildings or other critters that are there. We have to do this, those kinds of bat surveys and so forth. A lot of work has to be done even before you can tear the buildings down so that you fully comply with all hazmat requirements. And the folks that have to go in and remove these materials are typically hazmat trained professionals that have to do that. And so the lead has to be sealed or the asbestos has to be removed. That work requires quite a bit of time and effort. So in fact, we spend almost six or seven months just preparing to do building removal, building demolition, building deconstruction before we actually do things like wrecking balls or take the buildings apart. The future of these buildings is firmly tied up in the fate of our third E, the economy. The economy is definitely the weakest point of the three E's, as well as the subject of the most controversy. It is also the most complicated. If we think back to the beginning of the base reuse plan, maybe no one thought that, that cities or the county would need an incentive to build on the blight and to build mixed-use development. Um, the way the base reuse plan is laid out, the blighted areas are some of the priority areas for growth and development. And 
Um, the, the idea behind that is to have the future growth and development be close to existing services, be able to take advantage of existing roads and libraries and so on. Um, but, um, and, and if the jurisdictions had thought it through, they would have realized that by building on the blight and then the blight or the already built on areas and by doing mixed use development, they would actually realize um, a, a very significant um, revenue generating uh, stream by building close to existing uh, services it's just cheaper, um, and then um, you also, by doing the mixed use, it is the it is the uh, most effective way to increase property value and to so increase revenue uh, to the you know to the cities. The compromise between open space, don't develop, and develop has to be found in smart development. One of the biggest outcries, and I think rightfully so, is build on the blight first. Build on the disturbed land. So when I'm talking about disturbed land, I'm talking about where you see already infrastructure built in, roads, where you see those buildings that need to come down, or where those buildings used to be. The earth is already scarred. What we want to do is keep the pristine areas pristine and focus on the blight, build on the blight. The Whispering Oaks is a critical piece of property that, because there was a referendum publicly where development was planned on an oak woodland that had been undisturbed, and it takes hundreds of years for such a woodland to form. And what was planned there was the Monterey Salinas Transit Facility, which would have taken down this whole oak woodland on 58 acres. And the public outcry was, no, that's not where you put a bus service area, your administrative offices. You put that out at the marina airport. You put that at other areas of former Fort Ord where it's already disturbed. And you preserve that oak woodland for the quality of life for the generations to come. I'm hopeful that we will get the blight removed on former Fort Ord. That's one of the huge impediments to economic growth. People driving along Highway 1, they look, they see the blight. People bring their students, bring you mm -hmm. to CSUMB, your mom or dad, bring you there and say, geez, do I want to send my kid here who's going to be 18 years old for the first year of college? And they look around at the blight that surrounds the campus. It's not conducive to economic recovery. So right now, that's one of the key factors that Fora is looking at, is how do we make sure that we get rid of the blight? But a lot of the blight the developer is already required to get rid of. And because they're not having their home sell as fast as they thought, they don't have the funds to remove the blight. So it's this kind of catch-22 that we're all trying to address, but that's really critical for us. One of the pillars of the base reuse plan is rebuilding the population lost by the base closure. Apart from our inherently beautiful landscape, affordable housing and job creation are the main elements at play for people considering moving here. Everybody in the public is screaming for economic recovery and for jobs. And while we have had some success with jobs, they're not the jobs that we all want. We have limited numbers of those jobs. The base reuse plan was really trying to bring in research and development, bringing in what they call export industry, where you come, you make manufacturing businesses. You do something besides just do retail sales, something that creates an economy and a place for people to work that's exporting their products out beyond Monterey County. Monterey County relies on three focuses for its economics, agriculture, education, and tourism. So, so far we haven't gotten to add that element that's been so successful, for example, in Silicon Valley, where you have all of this high-tech industry. We haven't gotten the research and development, the economic clusters that the base reuse plan was envisioning. The base reuse plan is premised upon mixed use and it's premised upon trying to create what they called villages. In fact, the dunes used to be called marina villages, university villages. 
But the idea is the proper planning, the, what the planners are all telling us is that people want to be able to live, walk out of their home, and walk a quarter mile in any direction and get their groceries and get to work. We're trying to have a sustainable environment where we're not car dependent. And to do that, multi-use is trying to make your communities what we call dense, denser. So how that can look, examples that we all have seen of, of dense projects where you have this integration is um, Santana Row in San Jose, where you have retail stores, you have the houses above them. And if you think of big cities, San Francisco, those are examples where you have your housing above your retail, above your offices. You have offices buildings next to storefronts. You have all of it mixed, and people don't aren't car dependent. They get out, walk out of their homes, and they walk to the places and use public transportation. So if we plan multi-use, we're going to work towards a sustainable environment. We are going to work towards public transportation, getting people out of their cars, walking, biking, using buses. We're going to have a healthier generation of individuals, and that's what's being demanded. That's what smart development is, is looking at. The housing market finally turned around after the recession. However, many of the homes being built are simply too big and too expensive for the current market. The road to job creation has been long and winding, and it continues to be a painstaking process. Development does create jobs. However, they obviously end once construction is finished. Everyone's communal goal is to lure quality employers, both for long-term county residents and for fresh crops of college graduates. There are countless opposing views on what these jobs should look like and how to bring them in. Research and development, light industry and health facilities represent the highest echelon of job growth. Tourism and retail also offer dependable job opportunities. Between former Fort Ord, the Naval Postgraduate School, the DLI, and other military Military institutions here, the military community is a rich and prevalent part of Monterey County. This is why it is important to honor service members both past and present. On former Fort Ord, that's happening in two powerful and significant ways. Upon its completion, the Veterans Association and the Department of Defense Clinic will be the first clinic in which both veterans and active members can get treated under the same roof. So the point of the new clinic is to combine those two populations the active duty and their dependent population and the veteran population in a much larger facility. This is going to be 150 roughly thousand square feet, three stories tall. It's going to provide a lot more services, services that we didn't ever have before uh, from the active duty perspective, especially things like pediatrics and OBGYN because we're talking about young families in that case that are having children and do have those issues. Uh, psychological, uh, larger psychological help for maybe some active duty, but certainly for a lot of veterans. More sophisticated diagnostic capability here so that we don't have to send it out and pay for it on the economy or have the veterans, most of us are getting a little long in the tooth these days, and have to go up to Palo Alto is, is a difficult chore. So to have all of that here will cut down dramatically on the expense of sending active duty and their families and veterans out to the civilian economy, cut down on the, the travel burden to the veteran to go to the, the larger facility in Palo Alto. Um, as you age, it gets harder and harder to do those kinds of things. Although there is a very small clinic in Seaside, the next closest facility of this caliber is in Palo Alto. It's a long trek for many of our elderly veterans. The importance of the VA DOD clinic cannot be overstated. It is the first clinic of its kind and there is no better place for it. The Veterans Cemetery is finally happening. Funds are still needed to complete the project, but construction is underway. Families holding on to the remains of loved ones will be able to lay them to rest in a beautiful nook on the former Fort Ord's land. There were a lot of obstacles along the way. Uh, this cemetery when constructed will be a state veterans cemetery. The National Cemetery Authority is providing a grant to construct the cemetery in part. They require monies from the local uh, area, the local uh, governments and agencies, etc., to help defray some of those costs as well. 
but they won't build the cemetery uh, because there's another one within 75 miles as the crow flies from here that is open and has space, and that's at Santanella in the Central Valley, which is a long, 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 long way from here if you're an 85-year-old widow trying to go visit your husband. We have an extraordinary opportunity here with the former Fort Ord. After decades of controversy and indecision, a new identity is being forged from what was left behind. Progress may be slow, however. Many believe it is better to be deliberate with each choice rather than to rush to develop for the sake of turning a fast profit. It's a continuum. People are impatient, and when you take a look at how politics move, how the economy moves, how we achieve these successes, we have to look long term. We can't be impatient. We're all trying to work and de make decisions today that don't just meet our short term needs, but are planning for you to have a place to live and work and for your children to have a place to live and work. And that's why we can't just um, push forward and continue to ignore how all of this integrates with the economy. You know, the history of Fort Ord continues to be ongoing. Uh, it's, we're, we've entered a new phase. Um, the Army will still be here, uh, managing its personnel and its, ha and its family housing areas, and the DOD Center will still be here. But there'll also be many, many, many new uh, housing developments. Many, many new civilians will be living in the area. Um, the old barracks that were a blight on the landscape after the Army left the area and they fell, they fell into disrepair, uh, most of those will be removed uh, in the near term. Um, and the area will be looking a lot crisper, I will say. Um, so, th uh, and there will be many new parks and uh, uh, amenities and restaurants and, um, and, and of course affordable, well, we, some affordable housing units will also be created in these new developments. So it's, it's a win for everyone. It's a true swords to plowshares um, initiative, uh, redeveloping Fort Ord. Um, it has taken many years and there are still a few years to go. The cleanup efforts have been doing um, very well as well. Let's talk a little bit about the base realignment and closure uh, commission process. One of the mo most important um, parts of transferring an army base for civilian use is to make sure that the landscape where the army occupied for more than 70 years at Fort Ord is clean and safe for the public. Uh, and so the army immediately began a cleanup process. Uh, as everyone knows, there were several Superfund sites at Fort Ord because um, of related, mainly related to munitions, but also there was some groundwater contamination because of pollutants that um, the Army didn't do as good a job at taking care of at the time as it should have. Um, so the groundwater situation is being cleaned up. Uh, it's a multi-year process, multi-decade process, um, but the, the plumes that, uh, the groundwater contamination, the plumes as they call it, the extent of the contamination are steadily shrinking. Uh, due to the uh, continual processing uh, and cleaning of the water. The groundwater is taken out. It's processed through these large carbon filtration uh, setups that are dotted around Fort Ord. Um, and, and, and everyone is drinking safe water. Um, and that water will be uh, cleaned up eventually. Um, also, the, uh, the prescribed burns have been taking place, which allows the Army to clear munitions. Um, and they have been doing that for the last 15 years. Uh, they have been making steady progress, um, but it's a slow process because many, uh, it's dependent upon, of course, doing the prescribed burns, which is uh, an activity which is uh, very dependent upon having the appropriate weather situation. So it doesn't take place every year. Uh, the Army projects, I believe, about eight to ten more years uh, of prescribed burns in the former munitions um, areas where munitions are concerned uh, at Fort Ord. Um, and guessing that a few more years after that to complete the cleanup. So we're, we're looking at probably up to 15 years before the munitions uh, are fully cleaned up at Fort Ord. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's providing some uh, job opportunities for folks and the uh, land is slowly being transferred to the, uh, the, the Bureau of Land Management and other areas for use. And I expect that to continue. I'm Cameron Binkley, the Command Historian for the Defense Language Institute Foreign Language Center. Thank you for watching People and Places. Thank you.